Buck will be back tomorrow. He's traveling. We have a photo shoot. Don't even get me started on the three-hour photo shoot that we have. I didn't pick out my clothes. I wonder if Buck picked out his. I, I, my wife doesn't trust me to pick out my own clothes to get my photos taken, so that probably gives you a good sense of my fashion sense uh, as I'm sitting here in a T-shirt and shorts doing the show. Tulsi Gabbard joins us now. Tulsi, do you pick out your own clothes for photo shoots, or do you have a stylist? Do you think you have good <laughs> style? I, my wife has no faith in my style. <laughs> Uh, I'm laughing as I was hearing you say that. Uh, I, I don't have a stylist, but generally if I'm doing something fancy like that, I will ask my husband and I trust his taste far more than I trust my own. I, I'm sitting here in workout clothes as I'm talking to you today, so so we're good. So let me ask you this. I, how long have you been married? Uh, we just celebrated our ninth anniversary. Congratulations. We're about to celebrate 20. My wife for 20 years has asked me, what should I wear to an event? And for 20 years, I've had no idea what to tell her. (laughs) Does does your husband give you good advice on what to wear to events? I mean, it's actually kind of curious because you have so many formal events, I would imagine, and, and things to go to. Like the whole concept of what to wear to things for women, I have no idea. It's a real problem. It's a real problem, Clay. Um, I, I am of the mindset that in an, you know, in a 24-hour period, and maybe you can relate, we have a lot of decisions to make just in the course of a day. Everything from, yep. you know, what am I going to have for breakfast or what to far more serious things. And so for me, I like to minimize the decisions about what I wear to be as simple as possible. It's why Amen. I love one of, one of the reasons why when I'm on Army duty and in uniform, like that is that is the easiest thing. Um, so I just, I keep it very simple. So if I have to break out of my normal rotation of three suits or blazers that I use, um, I do ask my husband, he has, he has great tastes, um, in just being able to tell, like, uh, I don't know. I, 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 he, he has never steered me wrong. He's a cinematographer. He's a musician. So he uses a different side of the brain than I do. <laughs> and, um, and it's always, you know, I just go for clean, classy, and simple. And, and he is on the mark anytime I have any question at all. Tulsi Gabbard, always finely dressed for the per- appropriate thanks to her uh, husband having great taste. Um, all right, let's dive into this. CBS News, supposedly VP debate. July 23rd, August 13th. They haven't set a date officially yet. How bad do you think you would massacre Kamala Harris if you got the opportunity to go head-to-head against her in a vice presidential debate? And how much, based on your experience in the 2020 race, would you relish that opportunity? Be honest. Is there anybody you would rather eviscerate in a debate than Kamala Harris? Ah, you know, I, I'm not I'm not one to, to hold personal grudges. However, I, I can say based on the experience I had in our in our interaction on a debate stage in 2020 and how surprised I was that her lack of preparedness to address her own record that she was running on during during her presidential campaign. She was proud of her record and yet asking her some very simple questions about that record completely blew her cover and showed how ill-prepared she was. And, and, and that has only been reaffirmed throughout her tenure as vice president. So I, I would love to have the opportunity to go toe-to-toe to, with her on the debate stage. Uh, there, there is n- not a lack of material to address given the substance of the failures of both President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris in their positions. Doesn't it speak to how bad she is that despite the fact that Joe Biden is objectively, I think it's fair to say, the worst president in most of our lives, they are terrified at 82-year-old Joe Biden stepping down because it would mean they would have to elevate Kamala Harris, who has managed to somehow be worse than Joe Biden despite the fact that he's the worst president ever. I mean, that really kind of sums up the awfulness of their combination, doesn't it? It, it does, and, and it, point to, it points to the, the lack of judgment, obviously, in President Biden and those around him. For him to make a decision that he stated from the outset would be purely based on identity politics uh, reveals the failure of, of that, whole, uh, that whole premise. I think the other the other thing that that just came to mind, given their identity politics, is 
is I know this because it's the, the excuse Kamala Harris uses every time anyone in the media dares to point out her failures and her lack of preparedness. It's she says, well, you know, they are racist or they are sexist. Uh, if, if I am going toe to toe with her as a quote unquote woman of color on the debate stage, I don't know how she uses that as an excuse to cover up her inadequacy and, and her in a, her, her, her lack of qualification to serve in the current position that she's in and to be literally one breath away from the presidency. We're talking to Tulsi Gabbard, four-term congresswoman, combat veteran, currently serving as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve, and she has a best-selling book, For Love of Country, which we'd encourage you guys to go check out. Tulsi, you grew up in Hawaii. I believe you are a big surfer. I think we've talked about this before. Would you have ever believed that men would be able to identify as women and compete in surfing championships to win women's surfing championships? As a woman who has grown up surfing all over Hawaii, if you and I are around the same age, if I had told you that was going to happen in 2003, 2004, 20 years ago, I think you would have told me that I was crazy and and maybe I would have agreed to make that argument. (laughs) But now it's Democrat standard orthodoxy. How did we get here? It it is. It's literal insanity. And I dedicate a whole chapter in my book specifically to this topic, both because of what the consequence is. I've spoken with a few of the women who are currently on the the world surfing uh, circuit tour and them expressing their frustrations because not only is it completely unfair, there are two different divisions for a reason. The physical capability of male surfers to be able to paddle into some of the biggest waves in the world is just different from the women. These women are excellent beyond, you know, I, I, I'm, like, I'm like in kindergarten as a surfer compared to what these women are doing and dominating around the world. However, they are different for a reason. And if they speak up about it, they, they will immediately see their sponsorships canceled and perhaps be kicked off the tour. Uh, we see this because it happened to Bethany Hamilton. You know, yes. she, she, had her, she had her arm bit off as a child. And so as a one-armed surfing woman, she is still going out and competing and doing things that I defy. Let me, pa- let me pause here for I a moment expect. with you. because wa- The Bethany Hamilton story to me is so amazing. If I it ever is. got attacked by a shark, because I think that's how she lost her arm, right? As a surfer, she was attacked by a shark. If a shark ever bit me, if I had the tiniest little cut ever, I'm not sure I would ever go in the ocean again. Can you imagine the bravery that it takes to lose an arm to a shark and then get better and go back out into the ocean with only one arm to try to catch waves? I mean, to me, that is a bravery that's unparalleled in terms of athletics and she's speaking out and saying, hey, there's a big difference between men and women. And it's like she's not even being paid attention to by many people. She, she's not. And, and worse, she's being retaliated against. And you're absolutely right. I mean, her courage and bravery as she was healing from, you know, the shark bit off her arm very close to her shoulder. So she, there, there's nothing there really to work with. She doesn't use a prosthetic when she's paddling. I don't even know if that's a viable thing. But she was eager I think she was 12 years old when this happened. She was eager to get back in the water to pursue her passion. And, and, and really what I respect in her and her story, it's, it's powerful for so many reasons. But as you look at the courage she exhibited then, and you look at the courage she exhibits now as a mom of, I think, three kids now uh, competing in, in incredible waves around the world, when she just stood up and said, men should not be competing against women in surfing, uh, her decades-long sponsor uh, immediately canceled their sponsorship for her, which is a way to earn her livelihood to help support her family. And there's this thing on, on International Women's Day that's become a tradition in surfing where the male surfers, as they're competing, they choose the name of a woman they admire and put it on their jersey. In these past couple of years, uh, me- multiple male competitors chose Bethany Hamilton as the woman they most admire. And after Bethany Hamilton made that statement, uh, the the World Surf League would not allow her name on these men's jerseys. Unbelievable. Like four or five of them wanted to feature her, admire her, applaud her, champion her. And they said, no, you are not allowed to have this woman, this specific woman's name 
on your jersey. I, I give her so much credit because she is continuing to stand up and speak out for free speech and for equality for women and girls and protecting uh, women and girls in, in surfing and in all sports. And I, I hope that more women are willing to, to, to do the same and men for that matter. I think this is important. I think I asked you this the last time you were on. You're in consideration uh, potentially to be vice president or to be involved in the cabinet. You and I have a similar political evolution. You were a Democrat. I voted for Democrats. I worked for Democrats. And then I finally just looked around starting about six, seven years ago in real earnest and said, Democrats have lost their minds. And I haven't really changed. I still believe pretty much the same thing I always have. But I'm now considered to be a right winger. Um, And as I talked earlier, people say, oh, I'm super controversial because I say things like, you know, men's sports should only be made up of men and women's sports should only be made up of women. I think there are tens of millions of people out there like you and me who are persuadable to recognize that things are broken in this country. They need to be fixed. And much of the breaking is being done by the left wing in this country. How many people do you think are out there persuadable and how do you think they respond to you when you make that argument? Oh, gosh. I mean, millions to tens of millions of people at, at a minimum. Uh, you know, my my evidence is purely anecdotal at this point, but I live out of a suitcase and I travel across the country and I meet people and hear from people every single day who say the same thing that you just said, who resonate deeply with my experience and your experience who are now being called conservatives or right-wing Republicans simply for standing up and stating what is obvious in objective truth of biology between the differences between a man and a woman, standing up and saying that the government should not be censoring speech. Free speech is free speech in America, that the government shouldn't be weaponizing its institutions against its political opponents, that our streets should be safe and our police should be allowed to do their jobs. Our borders should be secure. These things are not radical ideas. They are fundamentally American ideals. And, and I, I specifically focused in my book about uh, each chapter dedicated to one of these major fundamental principles. And uh, I, this is where I see hope and opportunity in this, in this election um, and where I've experienced my ability to connect with people and let them know, hey, It's not only okay for you to walk away from the craziness of the Democratic Party, but we must seize this moment as Americans and fulfill our responsibility as citizens to save our country and to defend our freedom and make sure we send President Biden and Kamala Harris packing on Election Day. Tulsi, you not only managed to write a best-selling book, you did it without bragging about killing a puppy or meeting Kim Jong-un. Congratulations. (laughs) Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll talk to you again soon. That is Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, and uh, yeah, she, she hasn't met Kim Jong-un, but also she hasn't killed a puppy. Um, it's really kind of amazing. Uh, and she's got a best-selling book. Tunnel of Towers Foundation has been committed to supporting our nation's first responders and veterans ever since we experienced 9-11 23 years ago. Heroes who put their lives on the line for our communities and our country. Heroes like U.S. Army Major Jonathan Turnbull. He sustained devastating injuries at the hands of an ISIS suicide bomber. He nearly lost his eyesight through 20 surgeries and countless hours of rehab. Thankfully, he's helped get back to being able to take care of himself far better. Tunnel the Towers paid off the mortgage, gave him a specially adapted smart home designed for his needs. He moves around the home much more easily now, and his home also gives him hope. With help from people like you, the foundation supports families like the Turnbulls. Join Tunnel the Towers in supporting America's heroes, our nation's severely injured veterans, and First responders, homeless veterans, Gold Star families, and the families of fallen first responders. Join us in donating to this amazing foundation. Donate $11 a month to Tunnel the Towers at T2T.org. That's T, the number 2, T.org. 95 cents of every dollar goes direct to their program.